April for this edition of Studio One. Thank you for joining us. April 2nd today. That means April Fool's Day was yesterday. Any good jokes? Tried everything and nothing worked. Yeah. I, somebody got me. One of my girlfriends showed me a fake engagement ring and I fell for it. Hook, line, and sinker. Oh, my. <laughs> Brand, that sounds like a good idea. No. No. No, it doesn't. Go. <laughs> In our second half hour, you, know, you don't know the half of publishing a book until you've attempted it. UND graduate student Jane Kurtz has written on topics ranging from coloring books to the heritage of Ethiopia. She'll join us to talk about the pestering process of publishing. In this half hour, some warning signs that could signal when not only your relationship, but your well-being is in danger. Donna Altmans will talk about date rape, what happens before and after the crime. That's just a taste of what's on your way, but right now, Jennifer Vandergan with the news. Thanks, Chris. President Clinton is turning his attention to international affairs this weekend when he meets in Vancouver, British Columbia with Russian President Boris Yeltsin. He's expected to unveil his aid package for Russia at the end of the two-day summit. Mr. Clinton says the aid program will be people to people. It will focus on helping Russia's business climate, food distribution system and oil and gas production. He warns Russia could revert to authoritarianism or chaos if Yeltsin's free market reforms fail. In Portland, Oregon, Mr. Clinton has been trying to resolve a bitter dispute between environmentalists and the timber industry. He's been at a forest conference hoping to find a balanced solution that will save timber industry jobs and the endangered spotted owl. Back in Washington, the Senate is trying to resolve its own dispute over Mr. Clinton's $16 billion job creation bill. The Senate did pass a deficit reduction blueprint, but Senate Republicans are blocking the vote on the stimulus plan, saying it contains unnecessary spending. Mr. Clinton urged GOP lawmakers to heed America's call for change. Diversity throughout the university and the UND Fighting Sioux name change. The topics were discussed again by University of North Dakota students, faculty, staff and community members. It was the second in a series of planned forums to promote multicultural awareness. The open forum was a chance for people to offer solutions and give opinions on the issues, especially the name change. I also have witnessed tears and the tears of our children and the tears of the parents who have been hurt by racial incidents do so much to the name. The Sioux name means absolutely nothing. It's ridiculous to think that the logo of a university is going to help the Native American people out at all. UND President Kendall Baker has started to coordinate other events for next school year. The forum was held in conjunction with UND's annual Native American Wasipi Timeout Week. Time Out Week also featured an entertainment evening with local and international talent. One of the acts was a Native American dance performed by the Seven Feathers Dance Club of Grand Forks. The act includes children from different schools around the area. The audience was also entertained by belly dancing, Native folk songs and other cultural acts. The event ended with a slideshow from the International Center which sponsored the event. Officials say events like this help create multicultural awareness. Academic awareness should be rewarding. At the University of Arizona, an A can go a long way. Apartment owner Roger Oster gives students a break on their rent if they get good marks. Oster reduces rent by as much as 10% for improved grades. He says he used to have complaints about loud parties, but not anymore. Now he attracts only serious students. The program is growing in popularity, and Oster says he has a waiting list. Another popular program got some attention this week. William Grant is executive editor of NOVA, the long-running science program. He talked to students about covering science issues on television. He says NOVA's 20-year run on public television proves that science can be interesting. I think NOVA's success fundamentally lies in continuing to understand that what the general television audience, not we're not making a program for educators, we're not making a program for scientists, we're making a program for people who watch television and adventure stories for curious grown-ups. NOVA broadcasts weekly on PBS. It has an audience of more than 10 million. Grant's visit was sponsored by the Grand Forks Herald, UND's School of Communication and Center for Teaching and Learning. And Grant also says that NOVA is committed to producing more fast-paced and exciting shows for viewers of the 90s, so we can probably look for some changes in there. All right, thanks, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got a nice surprise in store with the weather this weekend, and Brad joins us now with the details. Brad? Thanks, Cameron. Thank you once again for joining us. Have you ever wondered what causes a red or orange sun? 
Well, as you already know, white light is made up of a spectrum of colors. And when the sun is high in the sky, its rays only have to travel through this much of the atmosphere. Therefore, we see the blue and yellow rays coming to our eyes. On the other hand, when the sun is low on the horizon, then most of the light rays have to travel through most of the rest of the atmosphere and more of the atmosphere. Therefore, the longer wavelengths of red and orange reach our eyes. As a matter of fact, if you woke up around 6 o'clock this morning, you may have seen an orange tint in today's sunrise. You would have also felt a temperature of 23 degrees and the winds out of the east at 5 miles per hour. Other area temperatures this morning, the Dakotas mostly in the middle 20s and Minnesota upper teens. Mother Nature is always doing something to us and the parts of the states that are getting hit are the New England states this morning. When this rain shower activity is going down on the New England states today, they could see rainfall amounts of 1 to 2 inches by the end of the day. And the high temperatures for today, well as you can tell mostly 40s and 50s in the upper states and 60s and 70s in the southern states. And that's exactly where we'll be tomorrow, middle 40s and mostly sunny. The winds will be out of the east at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And tonight, clearing skies, a low of right around 20 degrees. And the winds will be calm. So tomorrow morning, you may see some fog as you wake up. If we slide into the extended outlook, you'll see mostly sunny skies Saturday and Sunday, middle 50s. And by Monday, we could see some clouds. But overall, this weekend, it looks like it's going to be a wonderful weekend. And Chris and Kim, we're going to see some tempting temperatures. Thanks, Brad. Finally, some nice weather to look forward to this weekend. Beautiful, finally for once. But you know what? Even with the nice weather outside, they're still playing hockey. We'll talk right. about that in sports. The North Stars of not too long ago were challenging for the top spot in the Norris Division, are now battling one of the worst stigmas in sports today, becoming a team that doesn't make the NHL playoffs. They had just seven games to right their ship sailing into Calgary last night. The Saddle Dome fans have been quiet the last few games, prompting the players talk to the press and ask for some support. Already up to nothing in the second, Calgary's Paul Ranheim on the break feeds Joel Otto, one of his two goals on the night for a 3-0 flame lead. The Stars start a comeback in the power play. Russ Courtnall dishes off to Jim Johnson on the doorstep, cutting the lead back to two. But Ranheim closes the door in the third. The slap shot that zips past John Casey is all they need. Your final, Calgary 5, Minnesota 3. To the top of the Norris Division, Detroit at Chicago, Red Wing Nick Lindstrom redirects the pass past Ed Belfour. Detroit takes over first place in the Norris with a 3-1 victory. One more stop in the NHL for you. L.A. skating at Philadelphia in a makeup game. Luke Robitaille with a goal and an assist. The Kings over the Flyers also by a score of 3-1. To, to the NBA, Patrick Ewing tossed in 30 points, including the nice jumper. New York over Cleveland, 91-83. In Orlando, the Magic are playing too good of hosts to the Charlotte Hornets. Alonzo Mourning dunks in 30 points. The Hornets sting the Magic 102-92. Finally, the world of NASCAR suffered a tragic loss last night. A plane carrying Alan Kowicki and four others crashed in Tennessee, killing one of racing's legends. Kowicki was just 38 years old. Let's get to some happier news. Time for our scoreboard to give you what I tried to. All of last night's scores on a roll. With the end of winter and the advent of spring, many people's thoughts turn to a certain grand old game where the object is to roll a ball across a glorious green carpet until it finds a hole. Studio One Sports reporter Brian McKenty talked to one person who thinks about that sport year-round. But her game isn't golf, it's pool. Most people think the only way to win money at pool halls is Minnesota fat style hustling. Meet Wyvon Fisher. She recently won the champion's prize of $500 at the Minnesota Amateur 8-Ball Tournament. I started playing when I was 15, and um, I've been playing every, almost every day since. When I'm practicing for a tournament, I play every day, at least two or three hours a day. I place in the money every tournament. I don't win every tournament, but I place in the tournaments. As you can see, just about anybody can sink a pool shot. Fisher says that's the easy part. Most people don't realize all of the work that goes into it. 
I play five, maybe five, four or five shots at a time. And I have to play my next shot just right so that I can have shape for the next shot and be in the right place for my third or fourth shot down the road. The rules of pool state that a player must keep at least one foot on the floor at all times. Having lost her lower leg in a motorcycle accident in her teens, Fisher walks with a prosthesis. She says this has presented some interesting scenarios. One time I was shooting a guy and he didn't know I had an artificial leg and I just like extended it and sat on the table, shot my shot and got back on and put it back on and he was speechless. <laughs> Fisher says there's no reason women can't play this male-dominated sport. With pool, you don't have to be strong or have a certain build to play the game. You have to have a stroke, a good bridge, and to be able to concentrate on what you're doing. You know, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, you can still play good pool. With photographer John Price, Brian McKenty, Studio One Sports. Brian also tells us why Vaughn finished third in a tournament in Bemidji last weekend, so he's, he's a great player. I think I need to take a few lessons from her. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. When we come back, Donna Altman's will give us some telltale signs that may lead up to a case of date rape. But right now, a look at some area events this weekend. Today, banks concentrate on many things, like how many branches it can add, or how big it can get. But at Community National Bank, we concentrate on our community and you. So we're ready to help when your car decides that today is its last day. At Community National Bank, we always want to be in the position to do whatever it takes to help you out the day you need us. Like today, maybe. Community National Bank, the bank that cares about you. According to national FBI statistics, one in three women will be raped at some point in their lives. Even more shocking is the fact that most victims know and trust their assailants. But awareness of some warning signs and characteristics can help prevent date rape from occurring. Donna Altman's director of UND's Women's Center, joins us to discuss those warning signs that even you may see in your relationships. Donna, thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure. First of all, is rape in general increasingly becoming a bigger problem? Well, I think it's been a problem for a long time. I think we're becoming more aware. Um, we definitely live in a violent society that creates an atmosphere that condones rape. And I think people are more willing to talk about it these days. So I don't know if it's actually increasing or if we're just talking about it more. What but. precautions should women be taking these days? Should, is a self-defense class something that they should do? Well, there's really no guarantee. Um, that somebody is not going to be raped and oftentimes someone can take a self-defense class in hopes that they can curtail a situation like that but that is no guarantee that it won't happen um, there are some characteristics to look out for uh, Mary Koss at Kent State University did some research back in the 80s and she was the first person to do national research on this topic of, of acquaintance rape on campuses she surveyed over 7,000 people across 35 campuses uh, across the United States and found that one out of four women had experienced either rape or attempted rape while being students on college campuses and that 90% of those women 
knew their attackers, uh, were friends with them, had dated them, that type, and had those kinds of relationships. Um, she also identified some characteristics to look out for. Oftentimes men who will rape an acquaintance um, lack social conscience, <coughs> lack a sense of empathy. They oftentimes uh, will talk in derogatory terms about women. They will oftentimes view women as adversaries. They um, subscribe to those very traditional roles of what is male and what is female. Um, and they tend to view a woman saying no as being a kind of a tease, um, leading, you know, giving permission for rape. So there are some characteristics to look out for. There are some precautions that women can take. It's important that before a woman agrees to go out on a date and be alone with a man, that she get to know him, that she uh, arrange meetings in public places, that she spend some time with him and, and ask him you know, about his views about women is and note whether he's aggressive, you know, mm -hmm. pay attention to some of his behaviors. Um, it's important that women be assertive, that women learn to say no. It's not okay for someone to touch you in a manner that makes you feel uncomfortable. Um, it's important that, that people communicate um, when they're dating about what their limits are, what their boundaries are, what their expectations are of that person that they're going out with and what they're what they're willing to to put up with and and not put up with. So. Now actually how many of these rapes are reported? Very very few. Um, acquaintance rape is the most underreported crime in the United States. I think one in ten is reported. In the Mary Koss study um, at Kent State I believe that um, 80 to 90 percent of the people did not report. One third of those women who had uh, stated that they had been raped didn't tell anyone. And that's not, they didn't tell their family members, they didn't talk to a friend or, or anyone at all. So Why is it that women are not reporting this? In acquaintance rape, uh, there, because of the sexual overtones of dating in general, oftentimes it's hard for women to identify what's happened to them as rape. They know that something sexual has happened to them and that they've been violated, but they identify it as sexual rather than an aggressive act of rape. Um, and that has to do with the fact that, that they trusted this person. So there's a real sense of um, doubting their own judgment. Uh, there's a tendency to blame themselves. You know, this is a person that I trusted, I should have known better, and so there's a lot of guilt tied up in it. Oftentimes they won't even identify what's happened to themselves as rape. So they, they don't seek help until a very long time afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, the consequences can, it can take weeks to deal with something like this or it can go on for years and it can have um, very difficult consequences for victims. And so, but oftentimes they don't seek help for a very long time after the incident. Briefly, what are some of the biggest myths about rape and date rape? Well, the most prevalent, I believe, is that, that r the rapist is this stranger lurking behind the bushes that jumps out and, and attacks you, and that's just not the case. Um, I mean, obviously, stranger rape does happen, and it's a very traumatic experience. Um, acquaintance rape can be more traumatic in a lot of ways in that the victim oftentimes knows the assailant, might be living in the same residence hall, might have to see him again in classes. Um, another difference between stranger and acquaintance rape is that oftentimes in acquaintance rape, lethal weapons are not used. The attackers will generally use verbal threats or coercion or just physical power to overcome. Um, so again, a woman who is attacked by a stranger is definitely going to label what happened to her as rape because oftentimes a weapon is used. Um, but then w when it's an acquaintance situation, again, the doubt comes into it, the guilt comes into it, and it's hard to identify. Um, another difference between stranger and acquaintance rape is that um, victims of acquaintance rape are generally between the ages of 15 and 25. Okay, Don, I'm sorry to say that we're out of time, but thank you for joining us oh, today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. After a break, not a taste test, but an advertising test for Coke and Pepsi. A comparison in the Cola War when we come back.
Stop by your favorite Hugo supermarket this week and save on Hugo's USDA Choice Beef Boneless Chuck Roast. Now only $1.69 a pound. Stock up on your choice of green giant canned vegetables. On sale at three for 99 cents. Four ounce cans of our family pieces and stems mushrooms are now three for a dollar. And stop by the produce department for Dole Bananas. Only 28 cents a pound. This week at all seven Hugo supermarket locations. Grand Forks, East Grand Forks, Crookston, and Thief River Falls. If you can't use force <laughs> to stop a friend from drinking and driving, Hop in. use hey, your wits. This is your car. Yeah. My brother had the same car. He never let me drive it, though. No? So you must have had me in mind when you bought this. Wait till he hears you've got the same one, and you let me drive it, right? OK. Yeah. Take the keys, call a cab, take a stand. Friends don't let friends drive drunk. Here's one time it doesn't matter who your neighbor is. Here's the other. Life's too short. Stop the hate. The battle between Coke and Pepsi rages on every year, from the unveiling of new commercials at the Super Bowl to landing the rock star contracts. The two colas are always trying to one-up each other. And this year was no exception, but as you'll see, they did differ on which way to drive home the sales pitch. Wherever you may be, advertising will follow. Whether it's spring break in Daytona Beach, or a front row seat in an Orlando Magic basketball game, Coke and Pepsi are trying to win you over. Pepsi has invested millions with the hope that Shaquille O'Neal of the Orlando Magic basketball team will score big with the American public. If the 19-year-old sells Pepsi products as well as he plays basketball, Pepsi Cola will be ahead of the ball game. When I decided to join with Pepsi, I think I chose the right one, baby. Uh-huh. Can Coca-Cola fill the Shaq size 20 shoes? They think so, and that's why they're trying a different approach by filling the gas tank of their new Coca-Cola road trip. It's a one-of-a-kind semi-truck, and it's paving the way for Coca-Cola. This enormous 25,000-square-foot complex, which first debuted in Daytona, comes complete with live entertainment, interactive video, sports games, prizes, and celebrities. It's great. It's, it's, it's awesome. Killer. It's bad. This is bad. The Coca-Cola road trip doesn't stop there. It will be used by Coca-Cola at various activities throughout the year. The truck leaves here and goes to the Final Four, so we're right back into the college kids in New Orleans, and then from there we're on to Texas. There you have it, two different colas with two different tastes. It's up to you to decide as the cola wars continue. It's cool and refreshing things for our young kids. We see this 12-pack right here? It's going to be called Shack Pack, so you better buy it and you better drink it. I don't know about you, but my vote is for Coke, both taste-wise and advertising. I'm a, I'm a Pepsi drinker, <laughs> so we'll leave it at that. <laughs> when we come back, a non-controversial mascot for the Grand Forks Airport. We'll meet Ricky when we come back. Mike, and we're going live in 10 seconds. Ready to dissolve to two, cue. largest group of Americans living below the poverty line. They have to reach higher for what others take for granted. Health care, balanced meals, encouragement to learn. But with help early on, children in your community can gain the skills to get out from below the poverty line. It takes programs like Success by Six and people like you to help them take the first step. Call to learn more. Change the world of a child and you change the world. Protect 
protects all living things in the forest. But he can't do it alone. Please don't play with matches. Put out your campfires. And never, ever forget the words of Smokey Bear. Only you can prevent forest fires. With a feline as the presidential pet, critics are calling 1993 the year of the cat. At Grand Forks International Airport, it's been the year of the cat for the last five. Studio One producer Kathleen Donnelly and photographer John Price introduce us to the only animal allowed on the airfield. The regular cat is a nice, nice novelty. Serves as our meter and greeter for the general aviation people of the airport. And, uh, and he eats a lot. Just wandered in one day, and uh, as I recall, came, came uh, it was a skinny cat, came dragging in, he was all beat up. He'd been in a fight, all beat up, one, one ear half chewed off. Blood all over his neck, their legs would have been. So the guys started washing him up, taking care of him, feeding him a little bit, and once you start feeding him, he was here to stay. He's become such a fixture at the airport, we went so far as to include him in some of the advertising that we put out. Uh, uh, suggesting they need to come to Grand Forks, especially to see Ricky the fire cat. I think he makes the kids feel more comfortable that come out here for tours. Um, he's probably the big, biggest attraction out at the airport besides me. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> he gets a little lonely out here when it's cold and the wind's blowing and they're they're having to fuel planes, and, and so Ricky provides the entertainment. And uh, reportedly, he's got his own ID card and, and everything, so he gets to come and go as he pleases at this point. Now, this is the only cat in the world that's been a governor twice. Governor George Sinner. He'd come in and, uh, he's an old farm governor, you know, the dog used to be he's an old farm guy, so he knew about animals and stuff, but the old cat had his finger in his mouth and clamped on. Of course, he doesn't bite hard or nothing, but. A couple of times he, he bit the governor. That's what I've always been wondering. No one's ever told me how they named this cat. I don't know if it's because he was fat or if he's lazy or what. And I was just kind of thinking that maybe uh, it's kind of like a little put down. But then again, he's such a good guy, I just figured they named him after me. You know? I don't want to be the guy that accidentally backs over Ricky, I'll tell you, because it's going to be a bad day for him. You know? It'll be expected, but it'll be one of those things that'll be, uh, um, <laughs> for a while, you'll be kind of looked down upon, you know, because I don't know if we can have a replacement. Quite an unusual mascot. I'll say, holy cow. Well, still to come, Dances with Wolves actor Floyd Red Curl Westerman shares his beliefs and the impact of the American Indian on today's society. And a look at the married life in the latest motion picture release, Married to <laughs> What have you done to your hair? Nothing. Then we must have an electromagnetic field in our hallway because your hair is standing on end. I wear love beads. Well, then let him wear love beads. It's my hair. You're going to be better than me, Christopher. I can see it in your eyes. No wasting your life on something you hate. Not for my son. You're going to college. I can see it in your eyes. I can see it in your eyes. You are going to do something important. Christopher, time for work. We've always had the dreams. Now we have the means. Please, support the United Negro College Fund. Late one night in Calabas Every week for the past four years, Stephanie has read stories to a room full of Savannah, Georgia preschoolers. Every week, the look on the children's faces is priceless. The love that Stephanie feels from every child has made her life a whole lot brighter. Even though Stephanie has never even seen their faces. To see how you can help in your community, 
all the points of light foundation. Do something good. Feel something real. Excuse me. Do you wear your safety belt? Why, no. I don't wear my safety belt. Thank you. You could learn a lot from a dummy. Buckle your safety belt. This is the second half hour of Studio One. We won't have a show next week. We're taking Good Friday and Easter off. Also this weekend, make sure to set your clocks ahead. Right. Spring ahead, fall back. Right. right. Yep. This weekend or Saturday night or Sunday morning, whichever. Brad, why do we do that? Well, to put it simply, we have to stay in sync with Mother Nature. Simple as that. Simple as that. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. <laughs> well, in our next 30 minutes, Jane Kurtz will join us to talk about the ups and downs of publishing her works and share some of the thought processes she has to go through while writing and putting together children's books. Also coming your way, Indian activist, actor, and folk singer Floyd Westerman will share not only his passion and beliefs, but the experiences of his many travels. All that in clips from the new Orion release, Married to It, but first, the news in Jennifer. Thanks, Chris. It's day 34 of the standoff near Waco, Texas, and the ball is in cult leader David Koresh's court. An attorney representing Koresh says he's done all he can do. Dick DeGuerin and another lawyer spent eight hours with the Branch Davidians, but failed to convince them to surrender. DeGuerin has asked the FBI to send in a doctor for Koresh, but agents say medical help is just a few hundred yards away. In Los Angeles, the defense has rested in the trial of four police officers charged with violating Rodney King's civil rights. The move stunned prosecutors who had been told to expect at least ten more witnesses. Only one of the defendants was called to testify. The case could go to the jury next week. A September trial is planned for four suspects in the World Trade Center bombing. Three of the four pleaded not guilty in federal court. The fourth man remains at large. An indictment claims they used an explosive to damage the New York City skyscrapers in February, killing six people. Immigration officials have revealed that the fourth suspect, Ramzi Youssef, was briefly detained last September after arriving in the U.S. He was freed after requesting asylum. The Justice Department says 36 Haitian refugees infected with the AIDS virus will be admitted to the U.S. for medical treatment. The government cautions this does not signal a change in U.S. policy, which restricts AIDS-infected immigrants from the country. It's merely complying with a federal court order issued last week. Between jobs and classes, many college students don't have the time to volunteer, but those who do find a lot of rewards. Derek Godry volunteers with a partner. He says he gets twice the benefits and double the fun. Derek and Randy have been playing on the same team for a couple of years now. That team is the YMCA's Little Brother, Little Sister program. The Y pairs volunteers with children who have a need for a special friend and role model. The pairs spend a couple of hours a week together engaged in activities both enjoy. The program offers a lot to everyone involved. Well, since I don't have a big brother in real life, it's nice to have someone to do things with. and It's like a dad, sort of. The kids aren't the only ones who benefit by becoming involved, though. I guess I've learned more from Randy than I thought. I thought I was going to be in a position to maybe be able to teach him something, and he's taught me a lot. Up to two years, the program director says that this is a great experience for uh, anyone. So the biggest need is just getting people to come in, realize that they can make a difference in a child's life. Um, sometimes they feel, well, I don't have anything special that I can give to them, or I'm too old to be involved in the program, and that's not it at all. With photographer Paul Kozar, Jennifer Vandergon, Studio One News. The Little Brother, Little Sister program has lots of openings for men and women wanting to spend more time with kids. There are monthly orientations for those interested. For more information, contact the YMCA. Authorities are still seeking information about Jacob Wetterling's disappearance. The abduction happened four years ago near St. Joseph, Minnesota, but his mother continues the search. 
Patty Wetterling travels around the country educating people about child abductions. She was in Grand Forks to speak about her son's case and her efforts to combat child abductions. Wetterling says the ordeal has been rough on the family. She says they've had a number of leads in their fight to find Jacob. I know of a couple from Minnesota that was traveling. They thought they saw Jacob in a, a sus suspicious situation. He didn't look like he wanted to be with this person. And in reporting it, um, it boiled down to it was a 12-year-old kidnapped boy. It wasn't Jacob. Wetterling hopes that by educating the public, she can help protect children and save parents from the trauma of child abductions. Protecting and saving baby teeth might help save our planet. Norwegian scientists are collecting baby teeth from around the world. The Norwegian tooth fairies are setting up a tooth bank. The scientists are monitoring the levels of several elements found in teeth. They hope to determine the nature and effects of global pollution. Scientists say babies growing teeth store trace minerals from the environment. And if you guys have any baby teeth lying around the house, you might want to send them over to Norway so that they can, you can help in the research. Just laying around the house. <laughs> Actually, I do, I do have some molars and eye teeth when I have my braces and wisdom teeth, so thanks, Jennifer. <laughs> in the latest Orion Pictures release, three couples create a friendship that includes all the male and female bonding type of thing, but it takes a bitter twist when one of the marriages turns sour. Here's a look. Yeah, romantic, but I like being with just Chuck. Oh, there's nothing like monogamy. Oh, I agree completely. That was then. This is now. Big shot like you can't be married to some hick from Iowa. You're not some hick. You're my hick. I love this car. I think you married me for this car. Legs first, then mind, then car. Did you guys ever drop acid? Never. We never took drugs in our lives. I minced, I chopped. And you whisked. You're a wizard with a whisk. It is all in the wrist. <laughs> oh, we met in a barn. No. <laughs> we'd watch and we'd wait for the animals to do it. Don't! Oh, God. Isn't it true? Come on, Claire. You can't turn your back on the fact that we were meant to live our life in pairs. Yeah, sure. Ever heard of Noah's Ark? Ever heard of the Titanic? New York is full of beautiful women. It's so exciting. Don't talk to me about beautiful, exciting women. Oh, my God. Claire and Leo getting a divorce. What's he like? Shipping tycoon. Tall, dark, handsome. Rich, powerful, romantic, sexy. Sounds awful. Call Leo. He's beautiful. <laughs> Ow! It's a movie about three divergent couples who come together through a series of odd circumstances. It's one couple is played by Sybil Shepherd and uh, Ron Silver. She is a very successful, beautiful, uh, wealthy woman. I can't believe I killed myself to get back from Washington so we could watch dirty movies, and now you're telling me? Ron Silver is a toy manufacturer who has a 12-year-old daughter from a previous marriage. And I always love a good comedy. I got to play kind of a nasty character, and that was fun. Oh. For you, your daughter put you down for the refreshment committee. Daughter? Good God, do I look like a mother? Limousine is no place for a kid. Caroline Kennedy grew up in a limousine, and she turned out perfectly this fine. This is serious, Claire. It was divorce, it was a real bummer. I want out, Leo. I've got a cleaver in my hand. Are you sure you want to have this discussion now? Stockard and I uh, play John and Iris, uh, and uh, You've probably been married, oh, at least 15 years, and uh, the passion's kind of gone. I'm sure they had hot sex. <laughs> hot sex? What's that supposed to mean? You know what it means, Iris. It hasn't been that long. I can't really do research. I mean, Bo and I weren't about to go off and get married for 15 years before we did the movie. You guys have all been so wonderful. Fun. What are friends for? And we talk and you hang out. We laugh a lot together. What <laughs> 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 I tend to treat Iris almost like a buddy. <laughs> it's very curious. In a marriage, to get along with another person, you kind of de-sex them. Do I have to wear a tie? 
You can go starve naked for all I care. It'll never fit me. Of course it will. This part stretches all out this way, and this part pushes everything up and out the top. Yeah, well, but I, I, I don't know if I want everything up and out the top. You may not be communicating, but you may not be aware of it. You should borrow a player's clothes more often. <laughs> What? If a person doesn't bust you on that, then how do you know? The fun part about being a part of a great cast is you get to really um, play with everybody. <laughs> oh, what a prepare. fun set this is. Well, these are people I grew up watching. They, to me, they were like Boris Becker, watching him play tennis and going, wow, isn't he great? And then suddenly you're, you're facing him across the net. There's been some serious bonding going on. All the things that first attracted you to the person are now making you want to jump out a window. It's fun, say that. Everybody needs a wife, let's face it. Marriage is what? <laughs> An oasis in, a, in what sometimes is a very crazy world. I think we'll leave the marriage jokes out of the show this week, Kim. Thanks. Touchy subject? Uh, no, but uh, we'll just talk about what's coming up next. <laughs> we come back, the man who feels it's his job to carry on Indian traditions, Floyd Red Crow Westerman, when we come back. Today, banks concentrate on many things, like how many branches it can add, or how big it can get. But at Community National Bank, we concentrate on our community and you. So we're ready to help when your car decides that today is its last day. At Community National Bank, we always want to be in the position to do whatever it takes to help you out the day you need us. Like today, maybe. Community National Bank, the bank that cares about you. good it felt the first time you gave five? Well, now there's another way to give five. Set a goal to give more. Five hours a week and 5% of your income to the causes you care about. It'll make you feel like a winner every day of your life. So give more. Give five. Call 1-800-55-GIVE-FIVE. Our next guest made his big screen debut in the motion picture Renegades, playing the Lakota Sioux father to Lou Diamond Phillips. Since that time, Indian activist and, cult and country folk singer Floyd Red Crow Westerman has added to his list of screen credits with roles in Oliver Stone's The Doors and the Academy, Academy Award winning Dances with Wolves. Studio One associate producer Suzanne Randall had the opportunity to speak with Red Crow about his acting accomplishments and his representation of the Indian people. Red Crow is a uh, name that my family thought I should take again as my grandfather's name. He was one of the representatives of the Dakota Sisetuan Wakpetuan tribe. And uh, the way you say it in Dakota Sioux language is Kanchi Tuta. So uh, I think that today many people are returning to their traditional identities. And one of the most uh, visual and uh, uh, ways to identify themselves is to take up their traditional names of their, their grandfather. Red Crow itself was, the, the identity of Red Crow was, the name was uh, brought out as because of the crow, it was a very strong symbol in our, in our family. And as among all Lakotas, the crow identifies a very strong symbol of connection to the bird people, the crow was always with us. Red is uh, identified with, uh, with uh, the courage that a people has within his own, his own community. So I think the combination, the name itself is how he got the name. In all of your acting pursuits, you seem to have brought a sense of dignity 
heritage and a meaning to things that have been sacred to Indian people. I have read that you feel you've been passed down a baton by someone. What exactly does that mean? Well, I got started in acting in movies. Uh, I believe it was handed to me through Will Sampson, who was in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He expressed his confidence that uh, I could do a good job. And uh, I thought it was a very spiritual thing for here's a man who was he was obviously very, very seriously ill in bed, but he wanted to give something to me you know, and ask me to do something for him. And in a way, when you get in front of a camera today, you represent a lot as an Indian individual. You're representing your people in a real important category. Ever since then, that time, um, I've had 20 movies or, and TV shows within six years. So I know I've been on a roll simply be what he gave to me. Of all of those movies you've been involved in, you're quite famous for your role in Dances with Wolves. What was it like working with director Kevin Costner? Well, I think he's an uh, excellent uh, individual uh, as, as a person and a director. He was his first try. He knew his ability to communicate was a very important. He talked and worked with uh, Indian people, Indian children and got them to perform like that, you know, in a movie and make a, a phenomenal kind of film in the Hollywood business. Mukita ma koche kile tu e ka iu ha chimpi. Na o o yuk cha shi che. Wo i chu kile na wa kan i jino ki hi. Ni wa u kile i chu ha wa shi chu ki hi pe. To hata ki o wakwala o ganaya o wa oye. Le toki ataya i wo ungla ka pitelo. To shkeki i chung pichan ka heche. Chichi pazo piktelo. Uchaya kelo. Wa shichu ki auwelo. Hi hane ki o ki gla ka piktelo. A lot of Indian people felt this movie was meant to be because uh, there were many occasions when this film could have been stopped if he, w if he himself was hurt being the lead act role and then such a dangerous thing as riding through buffalo herds. But there was a spirit behind it that carried him through all this where we know it was supposed to happen. You've been singing country folk music since 1969. Throughout those years, what have been some of the messages you've tried to convey through your music? Well, I've always been focused on passing on the Indian point of view wherever I go. I've been to Europe 50 times in 18 years in the area of human rights for Indian people. I've traveled around the world with Sting uh, in the area of human rights for the Amazon people. One of the most poignant songs uh, I sing about is the Christian missionaries. Uh, I, I, uh, in the song, I asked them to stop Christian work, missionary work, and stop missionizing Indians and Christianizing them because they have a religion of their own. You're definitely a man of many hats. Out of all of your experiences that you've ever had in your life, which has been your favorite? I prefer to be known as a singer, a uh, songwriter, uh, expressing the Indian point of view for the human rights of Indian people in this hemisphere. You mentioned that you're an advocate for the children as well. Can you offer today's generation any advice? Well, I think that uh, people uh, who have strong traditions should hang on to them. They have a lot to say for people to give them an idea, uh, identity and a direction. And I'm, my, my concern is about Indian children in this society. This society seems overwhelming sometimes. But if they go to their Indian identity that has cultural values and teachings of how you should walk this earth, I think those are all there and Indian people have them. When we come back, how to get your, sto your story published, sort of. Jane Kurtz joins us after a break.
Lowe's Supermarkets bring you savings this week with these special values. In the produce department, save on Dole Bananas, now only 28 cents a pound. Pick up a dozen Our Family Great A Large Eggs, only 59 cents when you use your Hugo's More card. 25-ounce boxes of Kellogg's Frosted Flakes are on sale, just $2.49. And take home a can of your favorite Hills Brothers Coffee, only $2.99. Hugo's Supermarkets always save you money. Hugo's, Grand Forks, East Grand Forks, Crookston, and Thief River Falls. This is where I live. There are lots of doctors and machines for me and the other kids. Last week, a guy named Mike came. He took us all on a camping trip. Mike gives up a weekend a month to help a disabled child, but he gets back a feeling that lasts forever. When I get better, you know what? I'm gonna take Mike fishing. To find out what you can do in your community, call the Points of Light Foundation. Do something good, feel something real. Out of Ethiopia as a child and into Simon & Schuster Publishing as an author. Our next guest is still finding more ins and outs of publishing, even with over 30 articles and books to her credit. Although Jane Kurtz specializes in writing for children, her latest effort, Ethiopia, the Roof of Africa, provides an in-depth and interesting history of a country you hear a lot about, but probably know very little. Jane is scheduled to have another children's book out this fall and joins us to share some of her knowledge on the printing business. Jane, thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you. First of all, travels of your life took you to Ethiopia. And as, you, as a child, what right. moved you to return and, die, and write a story on the history? Well, it was really what you said in the introduction, the fact that people in America know so little about Ethiopia. All of our images of Ethiopia here in the States for the last 20 years have been the pictures of starving children, which, horrifying and sad as that may be, that's not all there is to Ethiopia. And since I spent my childhood there, it bothered me to see that people really didn't know anything about this country that I, I really love. It took me a while to do it. I had to be almost 40 before I decided that I was really ready to go back and write about my childhood. I don't know quite what finally spurred me, what kind of gave me that final push, but eventually I decided that's what I needed to do. And even though I knew a lot about Ethiopia, when I wrote my nonfiction book about Ethiopia, I still had to do a lot of research. And that was good for me, to learn more about the country I grew up in. The, your writing takes a lot of different shapes, not only on Ethiopia, but with children's books, between children's books and activity books and everything. Um, you have at least three books out on the market right now, the three activity books. But you also have um, some books out that deal with, the, uh, with actual children's writing and children's stories aimed at children. Um, what do you credit some of your background for, for writing children's book? Where, where did you get started and when did you know that you wanted to write? I've always loved to read and I think that's where almost every writer starts. I, I grew up in a very, very remote village where we didn't have any television, we didn't even have radio. So I read a whole lot as a child and when I was a child my sisters and I would make up long elaborate stories. <laughs> we would catch frogs and we'd gather flowers and, and we'd make them all part of our stories and we just spent our whole our whole childhood really in storytelling so for me it's very rooted in who I am this love of telling stories the, coming up with the story is, is one process but take us through the process that you have to go through <laughs> when you want to publish the book right that's a different issue and I have been working on getting published for about 10 years so it can be <laughs> a long process the, I'm doing a workshop right now on how to get published and one of the statistics I had to tell people right off the bat was that a, a major company like HarperCollins, for example, Harper and Row, gets 15,000 children's book submissions a year and out of that they only publish an average of two or three. Jeez. So it's a very, very competitive field and there are a lot of people who love to write, who are writing wonderful stories who probably will never get published just because of the competitive nature of it. I've written a lot of books, but I think the ones that were just accepted by Simon & Schuster, I just signed a two-book contract with them, and those are both Ethiopian folk tales. And I think one thing that gave me the competitive edge there was that people are looking for stories from other cultures. They are very interested in a place like Ethiopia that, as you said, is almost invisible to those of us here in the States. We only hear portions of what goes on there. Right. When you actually sign and get, and you've got your goal, you're, you're going to get published, uh -huh. they take some license with what you've already written, don't they? What, well, what kind of things do they have rights to change? You have to be prepared to work with an editor, and at the level that I'm publishing with, with an editor, say at Simon & Schuster, they will not just take your words and change them for you, but they will suggest changes, and then you go into a kind of a subtle negotiation 
negotiation thing. Actually, the first folktale they bought had been rewritten five times for another editor who wanted it, but whose publisher ended up turning it down at Little Brown. So it's, you have to be prepared to do plenty of rewriting. The other thing is that you have to work with an illustrator if you're doing a picture book, which I love to do. And the illustrator may illustrate your words differently than you expected. Um, that can be wonderfully differently, or it could turn out to be a disappointment to you. In your latest book, Real Brief, we have just 30 seconds left here with, with I'm Calling Maui. What kind of things did you go through with the illustrator on that one? I liked the illustrations on that one, but as you know, it's about dragons. And I didn't see the book until I sent it off as words, and it came back words and pictures. Wow. And I opened the book, and I thought, this isn't what the dragons are supposed <laughs> to look like. So you always have that question. It's a lot of different things. Jane, thanks for being on the show today. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. A final word when we come back. During the Gulf War, alongside our full-time troops stood another important group of people, the men and women of the National Guard and Reserve. In fact, they make up over 44% of our nation's defense. It makes you wonder where we would be without them. When your employees need time off to serve, be a hero. Give them the freedom to protect ours. Boy, I really did it last night. Got drunk, acted stupid, went home with... with... Who is that? What am I, stupid? How did I do this? Barry began to worry, really worry. What, what about AIDS? Then he remembered, hey, I'm just a cartoon. I don't even have to shower. Get high, get stupid, get AIDS. Vince, that new dummy cam is great. Yeah, it'll sure give people a whole new outlook on what it's like when you don't wear a safety belt. I think they'll get the picture. You could learn a lot from a dummy. Buckle your safety belt. We've already got another weekend upon us. Any plans for this weekend? No, staying home. Staying nothing, home, nothing studying. Big. Yeah, Fancy. going to Fargo for the weekend. Fargo, there you go. Brad, the weather this weekend's nice for things that are Wonderful going weather. I'm going to get out there and try to get my cycle started so I can go uh, riding around. Sounds good. Wear a helmet. What? You can learn a lot from a helmet. <laughs> That's all we have time for this week. Again, we won't be here next week, so you can look for our return April 16th for Studio, Sh Studio One show number 99. We're almost at 100. Also, remember to set your clocks ahead this weekend, spring ahead, yep. fall back. I've got it down now. Thanks for joining us. Until the 16th of April, take care.